I'm joined today with Dr. Adam Hamilton, a former director of the implant surgery program here at Harvard Dental School. Adam, you've kind of left, gone back home to Perth, now ahead of Prost, the University of Western Australia. So uh, we're so glad to have you back and still be able to come back and teach uh, our residents out here and do research with us. Since you're here back, we tried to go play some tennis because we used to play a little tennis together. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we were hit by oh, rain. some yeah. of the New England weather, right? It should be summertime here in, in Boston Alley. I know, I tell you, it's, a, it's the New England weather. That's what they say about it is that if you don't like it, you can wait, it'll change. <laughs> so much like the temperament here mm -hmm. to share a couple of cases with our audience that uh, you kind of wanted to put together. So yeah, so the, the first patient I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is actually one we treated together. It was a, a mutual patient of ours. Um, this patient actually presented to see me because he had some discoloration of one of his central incisors and unbeknownst to him, this was an endodontically treated tooth and actually had quite a large apical lesion and was undergoing some root resorption. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite an interesting part to look at an aesthetic presenting complaint but actually has quite a significant pathology that was present there. Uh, so of course we need to get that addressed prior to, to doing any restorative intervention. And interestingly, I spoke to some of my colleagues here that were more restorative colleagues but there was this opinion that the lesion was so large the tooth needed to be extracted and I'm really glad I sent it to you Ali. Tell us a little bit about what you managed to do for this patient and how we, um, what your diagnosis and opinion was of this. Right, so the, the tooth shows a fairly large uh, lesion that's spreading from the central incisor to even around the lateral incisor mm -hmm. and has a historical root canal which seems inadequate. There is also extensive apical resorption which oftentimes happens when you leave a lot of tissue and biofilm inside the tooth and the body is trying to naturally get rid of that. Therefore, it starts to invade uh, inside the tooth, especially if you have an open apex. And this, is, this causes some... Um, apical resorption and then internal resorption around the gutta percha at the apex of the tooth. And as long as this resorption is confined to the end of the root, then we would be able to manage this by redoing the root canal and then also providing an apical seal. Now, doing proper testing here is important and showing that the adjacent teeth, even though the, the lesion is wrapping around it, mm. is vital and it doesn't require root canal therapy. We know that the source is just this uh, central incisor. And so what I decided to do was to, given the fact that the patient was a uh, very busy person, we wanted to do this as efficiently as possible. So we did a whole thing in one visit of uh, going, making an access, doing a root canal revision, and then immediately on an uh, orthograde fashion, and then immediately raising a flap and removing the lesion apically and putting a, a retrofill at the apex, essentially trying to repair that resorptive defect. And all of that we managed to do in one visit and place a provisional in there and send the patient back to you. Yes, of course, following that, you know, once we've confirmed that the healing has taken a place and the fortunately adjacent tooth maintained its vitality throughout, even after debridement of that lesion, which was really, really good. Obviously, we need to come back and think about, well, now that the pathology is gone, how do we still restore this endodontically treated tooth, mm -hmm. bearing in mind of the fracture of that incisal edge, the discoloration, and also with the root canal treatment, obviously taking away part of the, the internal tooth structure, how do we minimize the risk of this tooth fracturing? So um, one of the things that we did do for this tooth was some other walking bleach technique, so internal bleaching for this tooth, which surprisingly only took about one session or so with sodium perborate uh, and saline without any hydrogen peroxide um, was left into place. You can see the discoloration through here. We did a Dynasty wax up to have a look at this. And a question that comes to me often, one of them is what is the rate of relapse of the walking bleach technique? Mm -hmm. And should we always crown teeth that endodontically treated, particularly anterior teeth? Right. right. And this is something that I find for me is really a, a, a passionate part where I do really feel anterior teeth should not be crowned where possible. Like on posterior teeth, we know that covering the occlusal surface will help to bind the cusp together. We minimize the risk of fracturing. But on an anterior tooth, when it's a single root of tooth, I think once you do your cervical uh, reduction, unless it's a really compromised tooth with a, a large composite which keeps coming off, there are much more conservative ways to restore these teeth. Right. How do you feel about that, Ali? Is, there, is a crown a kind of restoration that you normally would recommend for these teeth because of the seal or for a biological right. perspective? 
Um, because mechanically, I think that we're not always doing the best thing for the tooth once we reduce it down for a crown. Yeah. For me, uh, obviously, enamel is the best crown. It's the natural God-given uh, version that we have. And the fact that it is fused 360 around the tooth, that will give us probably the best protection. As we know, once we cut into these teeth and place the crown, due to the extrusive forces, you're going to end up having a little bit of pre-failure early on the lingual aspect of the crown. Mm -hmm. And that... That oftentimes is why some of these anterior teeth, the crown is still present, but because of pre-failure, you have leakage, and these older crowns end up needing root canals because of the chronic uh, percolation of bacteria from that lingual area because of the fact that the crown is slightly moving and percolating uh, bacteria underneath there. So anytime you don't have to put a prosthetic in there, the better off you are. But there are cases in which aesthetics are a concern, and internal bleaching is a great technique. Mm -hmm. In some of these cases, they may not necessarily bring the entire uh, collar back, but what's nice is if you can do a little bit of internal bleaching, especially with a more um, kind of a safe bleaching solution, su such as sodium perbroid, which uh, I understand you use, inside the root, what you can do is you can actually end up bleaching the root a little bit, because a lot of times, even if you put a nice veneer on there, if it's an old crown and an old root canal, especially an older root canal cements that contains silver for radio opacity, mm -hmm. cause a lot of staining in the root right. section of the tooth. So being able to bleach that portion of the root allows a little bit of translucency to look mm -hmm. not so muddy and brownish in some of these roots, but be able to get a little bit of a And should I be color. worried about external cervical evasive root resorption if I'm doing this? That's a great question. So external cervical root resorption happens, has been noted in 7% uh, to 9% of cases with hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. So the moment you stop using hydrogen peroxide, now you've reduced that there have been no cases actually uh, with the sodium perbroid. The problem with hydrogen peroxide is more efficient. You can do that in one visit mm -hmm. in office internal uh, bleaching. But if you're exposing the patient to 7% chance of uh, you know, uh, extensive cervical root resorption, I'm not sure if it's worth it. And that's so, a catastrophic kind of condition. You know, this sure is, a, is. A, often untreatable. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, we, you know, so I would explain that to the patient that, look, you got to be patient. We're going to do a walking bleaching that's going to take two to three weeks. So, you know, you've kind of held on to this tooth with this collar for so, so long. Out of the two to three weeks, it's not going to kill you, but it's going to reduce your chances uh, of losing the tooth significantly. And the 99.99% of people with, with a sound mind would kind of agree to that. Yeah. So that's so what we did. In this case, you can see exactly what happened. You know, the, yeah. that tooth ended up being lighter than the, than the adjacent yeah, teeth after one treatment. Job. So it, um, it went quite well. And, you know, from my perspective, yes, relapse can be a concern. But actually right. here, because we went for a conservative approach of doing a, only a labial porcelain laminate veneer, so right. preserving as much enamel as possible, but we also maintain an access from the palatal that if we need to do re, um, the re-intervention for the bleaching aspect right. or endodontic treatment, we can access through that without losing the prosthesis, right? That's, so that's I think beautiful. here, really a minimal preparation, keeping as much enamel as possible, giving us more flexibility in terms of doing uh, additional interventions in the future, I think really is a key part about getting. And you can see with that's the true. gingival health and the aesthetic outcome here, yeah. it's not going to be any better putting a crown on this tooth um, in terms of the final aesthetic outcome. And I really like your incision design going across for a semilunar incision away from the, the cratinized tissue so we can see there's you know, no recession or no scarring which is right. visible in the, the cratinized mucosa um, in any aspect which is visible in this, in this smile line. So. Yeah. That, I mean, your results are beautiful. It's just, it's just a perfectly aesthetic case, well handled and well done. And this patient that was told to extract the tooth already has this tooth, obviously. And it's been several years uh, since then. Um, you know, you asked a good question about relapse on these internal bleaching cases. Mm -hmm. And I think the relapse occurs primarily as a function of the etiology of the staining. If the staining mm -hmm. is intrinsic and due to calcium deposits, such as you get in trauma cases in which you have dystrophic calcification, creating a yellow brownish staining due to, uh, or even grayish, uh, due to calcification, dystrophic calcification. Those do very well and they don't come back because the main cause of, of the staining is due to the over presence, you know, over abundance of of um, tertiary dentin that doesn't have the same type of a refractory index as you know your primary and secondary dentin 
But if the cause of the um, um, discoloration is obviously intrinsic due to any of these genetic problems, that we all already know that, but due to chemicals, including metals, such as, for example, uh, any type of a silver or old post that has been leaking and leaching metal mm -hmm. particles has become oxidized. What the bleaching solution does is it will kind of reduce the material so it loses the staining, but over time it may re-oxidize if it's a metal source mm -hmm. and it could come back. So it, the, the, whether uh, the internal bleaching will work or not is really a function of the etiology of the, of the staining. So here, here's important. I think in this case it will do just fine especially because you have a very nice uh, um, veneer on there as well. But, uh, uh, but I mean, it's Fantastic. a great case. And I have to give credit, of course, to the master ceramist, Yasu Koabe here at Oral Design in Boston. Oh, they did an amazing job getting yeah. the, the really the fine details of the ceramic work um, for yeah, these veneers. And you, know, you can see, actually, we start getting a bit of a denting, uh, sorry, a bone reforming and a, a bridge right. kind of over the top of the, the lesion there. Do you expect to see complete radiographic healing here? Yeah, since in this case I did not use a bone graft, and uh, you know, because it's a you know four wall defect, <laughs> you expect these things to heal in without a graft. Although nowadays I've been moving to using a little bit more grafting than I did before. Um, in these types of cases, even though as you saw the original lesion was unwrapping the uh, uh, surrounding the lateral incisor as well. All of that is going to come back in, but given the size of it, without a graft, it will take several years for it to come back. So um, this, I think, is is this how long of a recall is this X-ray? Do you uh, remember? This is will it be about, at least two years. About a couple of years, yeah. yeah. So it will take, you know, based on Strindberg's uh, studies and so on, some of these larger lesions could take up to seven years to come back. It just, you know, we know that the bone is remodeling. Essentially, your entire skeleton is brand new every ten years. Mm -hmm. So it's just a question of when these osteoclast, osteoblast remodeling, you know front is going to reach that area. As long as you have no microbes or bacteria in there, the, uh, it's going to reconstitute the uh, original, uh, original architecture. The only pro issue is in cases in which you have through-and-through -through lesion, in which case then from both sides you can have a connect connective tissue bridge that could cause a problem. But yeah. this, I would expect in time, will come back. And, uh, and I really like this radiograph that shows, you know, of course, on teeth that undergo endodontic treatment relatively mm. early, you know, if say 11, 12 years of age, when the pulp chamber is still relatively immature, we end up with quite a large um, uh, uh, access cavity through here. And you can see that if you do a millimeter preparation, actually mm -hmm. on either side for a crown, you're really not left with much really? at all. Yeah. You know? and for, for someone who's still relatively young, that yeah. can be a, a really devastating thing for the long term of this tooth here. I mean, there's no question you did the most conservative and very likely most uh, long-lasting uh, prosthetic kind of uh, repair of this tooth for this patient. So uh, I, I think it's a great uh, but I think your comment about grafting with apical surgery, I think it's a really good segue into the second patient because yeah. this was also a very interesting uh, patient. It was referred to me actually by an endodontist after they'd already done the apical surgery. Um, the patient actually had an existing three-unit bridge that mm -hmm. was done in zirconia. It was a horrible bridge. You mm -hmm. know, she didn't like it at all. She had this endodontic trim and had to be redone. You can see it came with quite a large pathology. The endodontist um, did an apical surgery on the lateral incisor, and they referred it to me to replace the bridge. Right? Now, of course, the challenging part with this here is un understanding, well, what is the patient's aesthetic demands? Wow. How yeah. can we manage that part of it? But also structurally, when we took the bridge off to have a look at that, were these teeth really strong enough now to consider doing a new three-unit bridge? You know, because we were potentially considering doing crown lengthening surgery because she had a high smile line. Right. We really need to, to improve the health of these teeth. And structure of these teeth were already a little bit compromised, right? Fortunately, though, this patient was really you know, wanting to save the teeth, but she was amenable to adding an implant in between the two to try and have a, a better support structure for what we're going through here. So you can see we removed the bridge, we did an aesthetic analysis and did an assessment to see exactly what kind of proportions of the teeth we wanted to, how can we address a lot of the aesthetic concerns and complaints and obviously improving a lot of the health. But one of the questions that came up as we're doing the implant planning, how do we manage this tooth with has an apical, um, uh, not really a lesion because this has been treated, it has an apicoectomy that's been recently done, but it's not filled in with bone. Do we graft this area here now? Because we'll need to do some bone grafting to together with the implant. Is it safe to go back into there? Or do we really need to leave that to heal on its own? 
So uh, I think uh, the issue of gr uh, grafting in endoapical surgery is primarily, I mean, it's one that has been kind of debated back and forth. Most of the literature in endo comes from perio, and perio surgery cases have always been talking about getting these areas grafted, and primarily because, at this point, because of the need for placing an implant on the sooner side. Mm -hmm. um, the function of the healing of the uh, apical lesion, as long as the infection in the bacteria is gone, it will happen, but it will take much longer. So now, one could make an argument that, look, you may get a little divot there at the very base of the, um, uh, of the preparation. And these, based on the re newer work by Dr. Adam Azim's uh, group down at the University of Pacific, is, is very dependent. Maybe it's genetically dependent, or maybe it's anatomically dependent. Some of these cases may get a little tiny depression. You, the, the, the socket will fill, for sure. But the question here is, as long as it's a, you know, a, a five-wall defect, essentially, mm -hmm. you're just missing the buccal wall. But um, the idea of placing uh, it after the case has uh, already been uh, done, I mean, I'm not saying that would have any merit unless you want to create a potential site that later on, if it does fail, may have an apical. We just don't have enough literature right now yeah. to support one way or another. We know that it will heal once the infection is gone. And I've heard people argue that, look, you know, some of these cases that I go to extract after apicoectomy to place an implant, that lesion is not healed. But I'm like, mm -hmm. you are not hearing yourself. That's a confirmation bias statement, right? You're removing the ones that have failed. And they have failed because of the infection. Mm -hmm. So obviously that hasn't healed. So if you had put a bone in there, it probably the bone would have dissolved too and would have been a problem still. So the cause is always microbiological. The graft is kind of incidental. It's primarily needed for better bone uh, regeneration in cases in which you're missing, obviously, the lingual plate, and you're going to end up having a, uh, a connective tissue bridge in those cases in a large portion of them. So those cases, uh, in fact, probably a membrane would be even more helpful than, the, um, you know, just than the graft itself. Of course. But I have incorporated doing more grafting nowadays, primarily, if anything else, just for the aesthetics of it, so I don't have to deal on with it. It looks better on a radiograph. That's <laughs> undeniable. You know, you look at this radiograph here. So this is after the implant has been you placed. Think, yeah, it's beautiful. Well, I mean, technically, it's difficult if you're grafting an implant not to have the graft spread a little bit onto the adjacent teeth. Right. When you raise a flap, you've already right. came this end. So when you're already in that area, you've got but, the bone graft there. Why not? put it across there and just fill that yeah. entire defect through there, which we did. And yeah. you can see radiographically it looks a lot neater it sure than does. it did without that part it of does. it, but not any healthier because we know that the infection was yeah. treated That's in Instagram the primary ready. treatment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but across here, I guess, does it give you more confidence in the future if this stays in this radiographic appearance about, well, we're confident right. that there is no, no recurrence of the lesion because if we start to see a, a new lesion occurring, it'll be a little bit easier to determine that versus if you have an existing kind of defect there because of, of previous infection, is there right. a new defect determining or not? A little bit more difficult, I assume, to, yeah. to manage that or to yeah. di diagnose that part. I think it goes back, as we were talking about with bleaching, the same thing here is that the etiology of the lesion, right? I mean, if you've addressed the source, which is the microbial contamination from inside the root canal, with an adequately planned way of, uh, you know, first of all, doing cases, apicoectomy on cases where the problem is only apical and not coronal leakage, mm -hmm. in which case then you do an effective uh, reduction for three millimeter and then prepare another three to four millimeters, effectively removing seven millimeters of canal space and place an adequate seal so that there is no more microbial uh, egress from the root end into the area, that area will heal as long as it's a firewall defect. Um, but as we, you know, as you said, so, you know, I, and having a graft in there is not going to make any difference at that point because the source and the etiology is the microbes and the bacteria. A graft will do nothing except for getting infected, uh, if anything. So the key here is to, but, but as we said, you know, I've become more practical on placing more of them now because aesthetically it's a little bit easier to justify. A lot of people associate those radiolucencies with infection, which is obviously just the radiographic decalcification. Again, it goes back to the etiology and the mm -hmm. first principles of what causes things. But this is, this is, again, another wonderful case and a great service. So beautiful surgical skills are to place that Yes, so there. We, we got the implant place. Of course, we went through a lengthy provisionalization phase to try and optimize their health, you know, educating the patient by cleaning, getting really nice margins around and having done some crown lengthening surgery on the adjacent teeth there as well to improve with aesthetic proportions. Now, 
Of course, these root canal treatments were done. We did a post and call on the central incisor, on the lateral incisor, because there was the apical surgery and it had been treated. We, we felt a little bit uncomfortable going in there, removing the pre-existing post that was there. Um, but, you know, we restored the teeth individual with individual crowns and an individual implant crown. And Beautiful I think, job of creating that papilla, by the way. Which is not, not easy, you know. So that's, that's, and I think that's, that's a key of part about here because one of the, I think, um, decisions we had to make early on, and people would look at this and say, oh, I wouldn't treat it this way. I would have taken those two teeth out and maybe done two implants and a three and a bridge because mechanically that may be more sound or, or stronger than what we're going to do here, particularly in a patient that does show some signs of parafunction. You know, that lateral incisor now mm -hmm. is a little bit of a weak link from a mechanical perspective. But from an aesthetic perspective, by keeping those teeth, we really maximize aesthetic outcome because with an implant prosthesis, it's very difficult to achieve a papilla, to achieve this kind of soft tissue and have the options to later on in the long-term health of this patient to have the option of implant is always there later on as well. Right? right. So I think for me, that was also an important part of bringing the patient into the decision-making process. Right? right. She had the root canal treatments done. She really did not want to have the teeth extracted. And yes, arguably, you could say, well, we could maybe say it is unrestorable, although I think that's going to be pushing on the fringes of what most people would say. But yes, doing implants to replace all three may have been an option. I think there are definitely advantages in keeping those teeth, in, in doing some treatment to preserve them, but adding the additional implant to, to mechanically try and make it as, as strong as possible yeah. for, given the circumstances. Uh, and you know, Adam, one thing that people I feel like uh, don't consider when they're making treatment plans for many of these teeth is the fact that this patient is what, what 37 years old? Yeah, she's young. She was so, not old. But you can think about it that she's had 30 years on function of that tooth and didn't break off the way it was, mm -hmm. right? So the idea that it's going to break off now all of a sudden, but nothing much has changed since over the past, I mean, the apico is the apex of the tooth, right? But the tooth has been kind of in this shape of preparation for a good number of years. Um, so we kind of always this, you know, as, as dentists, I've noticed this myself too. We, we look at things that are momentary thing and then we look at our own past's knowledge to yeah. process what's the prognosis. We oftentimes don't look at the patient itself like, look, the, you know, uh, the tooth has been there all this time mm -hmm. with this bridge for under function, up para function, whatever it was, it didn't snap off. And um, I see that a lot also with my colleagues in endo where you, they see a case that the x-ray, the, the, the endo doesn't look so good, maybe it's a little bit short right? There's no lesion, there are no symptoms. When was the root canal done? You know, 15 years ago. Well, all of a sudden it has to be redone because it doesn't look good. It's like the, the value of time itself, you know, is, uh, is an indication for prognosis. You know, even though in finance, you know, in finance they tell you past performance should not be an indication of future performance. <laughs> I think a lot of these cases are, we have to kind of look at the past as well for making a judgment for how the tooth will fare. In this case, I think you did a great job of saving this tooth, and this is probably the right ideal treatment, which is the most minimally invasive, and yeah, also and less costly to the patient too. And the key part for me is when you look at the health, not only the gingival tissue, we managed to improve dramatically the health and the aesthetic yeah. outcome through here, um, but also radiographically, you know, I think we couldn't get better healthy outcome um, from a endodontic or peri-implant perspective than what we see on here as well. So I was really, really um, happy with how we managed to, to improve the health of this patient with this treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful healing of the tissues and the both uh, hard and soft tissues there. But the overjet and the, a little bit of extrusion of the mandibulas, what, what is the plan with that? Would it be great for her to get some orthodontic treatment? You know, I really right. pushed hard to try and convince her to do that, but um, unfortunately without agreeing to do orthodontic treatment, that wear on the lower teeth is not really manageable, you know, unless we try and do something really extensive like increasing vertical dimension and yeah. doing a full mouth rehabilitation. And it's not ready for her part of life to, to go down that pathway. Yeah. So, we have to accept some limitations or the plans that we can put together for these patients, but I think for her, this was the, the perfect plan. That's, that's terrific. I mean, I think this is this wonderful service. And from uh, coming from an implant uh, surgeon to try to save teeth, that's really noble. That's wonderful as well. Uh, you know, in, uh, right before we leave, for increasing the vertical dimension in cases like this, for example, is, what do you think about the newer you know, concepts and models of just additive dentistry? of adding a little layer, you know, to to increase the bite and so on. Do you think that that's something that's worth exploring? Look, composite, and you know, I assume you're talking about direct composite restorative right. materials, and they've definitely come a long way, right. you know, since the original ones. 
the thing that you find technically can be difficult to do that. So yeah. probably the biggest challenge is, you know, right. what is in these hands to really make it look good, but also make sure we don't have plaque retentive areas if we are going to do direct freehand and establishing a good occlusion again. So that's probably the tricky part. Now with more modern digital technologies doing diagnostic uh, digital wax ups, but also making clear matrices to then use injectable composites, that may be a way to be able to do that more cost effectively. But we still find that there's a, some limitations in those techniques, you know, it's still committing the patient to a huge restorative burden on every tooth. I don't think right. it eliminates that. These, this concept of being um, reversible treatment with just addition codes, it's not quite true. There are some things that you know, can't be completely taken back, but it's a lot more conservative than preparing teeth for crowns or onlays for sure. So I, I like the idea of additive dentistry. I'm a very big proponent of, of adhesive dentistry in those kind of situations. Yeah. Um, but any intervention we do has long-term kind of impact and consequences. Well, that's terrific. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, thank you so much for uh, spending the time with our viewers. Uh, and uh, I'm going to write below that any way they can get in touch with you if they have any questions or anything like that as well. In the meantime, uh, I was joined by Chair Adam Hamilton, the um, Director of PROS at the University of Western Australia, and also a faculty and lecturer at, at Harvard School of Dental Medicine. And it's great to see you back here. Uh, enriching us with your knowledge. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ali. And I hope that next time I hear we can finish off that tennis match and see who's <laughs> going to be the champion. Huh? I'm sure it'll be you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but terrific. Thank you. For real, no, I'm Ali Nase. Now let's take some tea.